Hey everyone, Duke Nuka 3D here with another mask in my collection, and today I'm going to be reviewing for you the MSA Burel Diaphragm Gas Mask. Now this is a mask I've already done a review on before in the past, but keep in mind, as you might recall, the one I had previously reviewed was a variant with a strange chromed diaphragm angle tube assembly, which was quite unlike the normal ones as you see here. And the whole intention with me owning that one was I was going to trade it back to Moulage for a normal example once he had sourced one, which he did, which I now own. And this one is in much better condition. The, uh, the other one, uh, the chromed one, had a few um, patches of dry rot with the rubber, but it's all stabilized and it isn't going to get worse anytime soon. But this one is very minty overall, so I'm very happy to own this one. So why don't we get right down into the history? So, as you might recall, the Burel series gas masks was pretty much MSA's first flagship line of standard air purifying respirators for the industrial market. It pretty much began by re... I assume it began by reutilizing Akron Tiso face pieces that were pretty much... Uh, I'm not sure if they made them themselves, but all I know is they reaffixed hardware... Uh, with these KT style lenses and they used the KTM style angle tubes rather than the Akron Tiso ones with the chin rests and the more um, the, the flutter valve guards that jutted out further towards the neck. Um, other than that, they quickly sort of rechanged their timeline with the Burel masks with by utilizing a KTM style mask, which was overall very similar to the military style from the First World War. Otherwise, um, but the main difference is being that the lenses were chromed, the internal patches for where the harness was sewn were slightly different in shape, more of a more of a lozenge or pill shape rather than a sort of trapezoidal shape like on the military ones. The deflectors were similar to that of the Akron Tiso rather than the large cone-shaped deflector pouch of the KTM. And really not all that much is different in terms of the hardware. But anyhow, those were utilized for quite a while. And w when the... Um, Burel Cops type uh, was released. There was a diaphragm variant which was released alongside it as well, which was based off of the Army M1 diaphragm mask. Um, the original M1, I mean the original Burel diaphragm mask would have been similar to the Cops type in that it would have been a stockinette coated black rubber. Uh, however, the one example of a stockinette coated diaphragm I have seen is in the private collection of David Christenberry, and his is interesting because it has the riveted harness like the later black rubber types as you see here, rather than a sewn down harness like with the stockinette covered cops type masks. And then sometime in the mid, uh, the, the 1930s or so, when they were introducing the black rubber variant of the cops type with the Yablik or Connell valve on the front of it rather than the KTM style angle tube, these got an upgrade as well, and this is the more commonly found variant of the Burel diaphragm, obviously. Um, anyways, that's about it for the history. The Burel masks uh, were introduced sometime in the 1920s, and the black rubber variants were around sometime in the 30s, and these got used well into the 1950s, as far as I know. Um, other than that, I should go out to mention that the name Burel is not the name of a company. It is, in fact, the name of a person because MSA back then had a tendency to take members who were on the United States Chemical Warfare Service and name their products after them because that was their big kicker back then. They were probably one of the first companies to get Bureau of Mines approval for air purifying respirators. Not one of one, not the first, but probably one of the first, and they kind of made a big stink about it. And it's like, hey, guys, look, we have people who worked with the U.S. government on our team and were naming our masks after them because they worked on these designs during the First World War. So Colonel George A. Arthur, I think, think yeah, I think it's George Arthur Burel. If, correct me if I'm wrong. Either, either that or just George A. Burel was a, uh, a chemical warfare service officer who, whom I believe was mostly in charge of, uh, I'm not, I can't remember exactly what he did off the top of my head, something about organizing the various companies, although that was mostly uh, A.L. Bess's job. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, Colonel Be um, fucking Burel was uh, on the chemical with the Chemical Warfare Service, and ultimately MSA would name their first flagship line of masks after him. And I'm rambling, so and I've pretty much covered all the history there is to know. So let's get into this particular kit now. So right off the bat, let's talk about the filters. I have two different filters for the setup. Uh, this one is a type GMB filter for acid gases, and it is identified by its white paint. Uh, there was a whole slew of different filters you can get for this, and some of them had D-rings on the side in case you wanted to use them with a simple neck carry strap rather than this chest harness here that you can see. 
Um, there's really not much to say. These are very, I'm pretty sure MSA recycled the old die stamps that made the uh, Type J and Type H filters during World War One. However, the bottoms are different in that the inlet valves are proprietarily a part of the bottom part of the canister itself, and they're not a separate piece that you can lever out and replace the inlet valve. So that's a bit weird, but whatever, it works. Uh, this one still has the cardboard seal intact on the bottom of it, I should note. And there really isn't too much else to mention about this one externally. Got a warning label on the top, caution, remove seal on bottom of canister before using, and all that good stuff. Um, the filters were interchangeable because they used a barrel type clamp, as you can see here, which would just, you know, you could screw that down and it would hold the filters in place. Um, that, instead of using wire and tape where it's more permanent, I don't believe the, no, the, uh, cop, the earlier cops type did not use wire and tape. They, they always used the uh, barrel clamps. And I do not have the clamp on this, so I will remove it and show off this this canister, which is a type, uh, what is it, GMD, I believe. I need to look at the markings. I can't really see it very well because it's covered up. But anyways, this is probably, yes, a type GMD canister. And this is for ammonia. And pretty much universally, all green canisters are for ammonia. And why ammonia? Because ammonia was a popular refrigerant back in the day, and it was also very, very toxic. So... Anyone working around large industrial refrigeration units would need some sort of protection against ammonia, which obviously MSA provided. And here you can see the inlet valve on the bottom of this canister without the cardboard. Actually, no, this one is a, probably a later one because this one doesn't have you doesn't use the earlier cardboard seals. This one just had a uh, an adhesive patch over the inlet valve, and the inlet valve was in very good condition. It's not dry rotting at all. Uh, there was previously a dent at the bottom here where this lip was curled inwards, but I have straightened that out since. Uh, for the most part, and you got extra warning labels on the top of it saying what not to use the canister in and also to remove the bottom of the seal. And you can also get a good look at the chest carrier harness assembly here, which is made of a very durable rough canvas. And uh, these these are the things you want to look out for the most, these little shoelaces here. These will often be broken or fraying or just missing entirely. Uh, so I'm very lucky to have one intact and serviceable. You got a nice clip on the side here to hold it around your chest and then a nice neck carry strap. Then this large steel clip over here is to hang the mask when it is not worn, uh, which I will <clears throat> show the corresponding D-ring here in a moment. Now let's get on to the mask because I'm sure that's what you've all been really coming here to see. This is probably, in my opinion, my favorite U.S. industrial mask. There's just something so aesthetic about a 1920s military design made entirely out of black rubber and just, you know, just so neat to think about. And I should also go on record to mention that these diaphragm masks were pr pretty much sort of like a deluxe add-on model. It's like if you if you wanted to have, if you had a person who needed to have their voice heard constantly, which is kind of the same rhetoric the military used, but in the industry, if you these were particularly popular among firefighters because obviously you'd need to hear uh, like someone's voice in that sort of situation. But I digress. So yeah, these were sort of the deluxe model, more or less. And as you can see, made of a very durable, these are probably some of the best rubber that I've ever handled. These these masks just don't like to dry rot. They do, but it's like, it's very hard to get them completely rotten. Uh, the rubber is interestingly fabric lined. There is a thin layer of stockinette in between the rubber and you obviously cannot see it, but you can sort of see it on the harness here. You can see there's a little bit of fabric right there. So all of this is fabric reinforced. It's just hidden underneath two layers of rubber. The lenses are the same type as the KTM and the early COPS Tissot masks. However, these ones are chromed rather than a black lacquered finish, uh, but they are brass. The angle tube is also brass and it has been stained black. This is not paint. This is some sort of metal darkening finish, maybe bluing or parkerization. I'm not entirely sure. And you have the flutter valve guard, which is the same as the MSA All, uh, All Vision. Yeah, I believe that's the right designation. So... If you have one of these masks that's missing one of these flutter valve guards, the MSA All Vision um, or the MSA All Service, as more people know them as, is a viable option, I believe. And you have the 10 inch corrugated hose, which is pretty much the same as the World War I hoses, except like, it's obviously not stockinette covered. And you have rubber bands covering the wire and tape. It's this beautiful sort of brown tape. I like that. It's sort of an orangish brown. It's really neat. And then you got the diaphragm in there, which you can see is a beautiful brown color as well. Reminds me of Bakelite. Um, there would be a Bureau of Mine stamp somewhere around here, but for some reason it is missing or worn off. There doesn't seem to be any remnants of it, so I'm not entirely sure why. I'm not a fan of these buckles, personally. They don't seem to hold all that well, and they just, they're easy to undo. 
and not and not when you need them to is what I mean by that. Uh, the harness is a six-point rubber, wrap fabric reinforced as stated before. On the back, you see Mine Safety Appliances Company, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Front straps to be pulled last, patented November 1st, 1921. Which is a weird thing to say. This is A lot of mis people miscontribute these masks to being from the 1920s when they're not. These black rubber ones are from the 30s. Uh, in fact, I don't exactly know what patent they're entirely referring to. I know Randolph Monroe patented the M1 diaphragm face piece sometime in the 1920s, but... Pretty much all of the MSA Burel masks have that patented in 19, November 1921 stamp on them, which really doesn't make any sense. Um, really not much else to see externally. Very beautiful mask, but why don't we move on to the inside, where it is also somewhat beautiful. Or very beautiful, in my opinion. Before I do, actually, I forgot to point out the D-ring on the lower uh, harness strap here. You can see there is the D-ring to hang off of the filter sling, in case you are not using the mask but want to have it at the ready. And here is the interior of the mask. Very comfortable. It's, it doesn't look all that particularly complicated, but it is a very comfortable mask. Uh, the lenses are kind of in an odd position, but you can see out of them fairly enough. Uh, you see the strange Tissot deflector, which is molded or cast as a part of the angle tube, and it is literally a metal tube that redirects the air towards the eyepieces instead of a rubber tube. You can also see the inlet port or the outlet port where the flapper valve is wired and taped on, which unfortunately up here it is starting to degrade and rot, but the flutter valve down here is perfectly soft and usable, but yeah, this uh, it's getting pretty rotten up here. Anyways, you can see throughout the back there the beautifully brown diaphragm and the orangish red rubber gasket holding it in place, um, and there really isn't too much else to see on the internals. There is a patented November 1st, 1921 stamp right between the lenses, and below that there is a strange F stamp. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, it's there. And you can also see how this mask was constructed before I finish up the video here. Uh, this mask, like the KTM, uses a chin seam, but it it does it quite differently, and it's very high quality. Instead of sewing the mask along the chin, what the Burel masks did, or at least the uh, later black rubber ones, they literally vulcanized it as one piece. So there is a seam here, a little bit of like rubber tape holding it in place, but it is all vulcanized together as one piece, rather than just gluing it or sewing it or anything like that. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is a solid piece right here, and there is no seam here, but obviously there is. And also you should notice that there are no rivets inside the masks, despite the harness uh, buckles being riveted on. This is one of the more interesting but kind of dumb features of the mask because say you wanted to replace or service these buckles and you obviously can't access the rivets from the inside because they're embedded into the rubber. Probably not one of the smartest design choices they did while making these masks, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and that's pretty much it for the Burel diaphragm mask. Again, this is probably my favorite US industrial mask just for how purely aesthetic it is. And I'm very pleased to have it in my collection. I'm very thankful for Moulage for trading the old dingy one back to me. Uh, or me trading the old dingy one back to him and getting this one off of him. So, anyways, that's pretty much that. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, be sure to leave any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns down in the comments below. And I'll see you all later.